Uh, the talk is a joint out between uh, me, Humberto, and Sergio. Uh, you have our Twitter handles here, so, uh, here, so please uh, feel free to follow us. Uh, we love our Twitter followers, and that's the main reason why we always give talks, especially me. How many of you know Zalando? Okay, how, ma how many of you have purchased in Zalando? Okay, it doesn't count if you work for the company. <laughs> Um, Zalando is a great. Zalando is an e-commerce fashion platform, uh, the largest one in Europe, and we help you know 200 million customers uh, get fashion by by clothes and so on. Uh, we have around 21 uh, million active customers, and um, in the tech department, we are around 1,800 people right across different locations: Dublin, Berlin, Helsinki, and so on. Uh, so you know when people come to our side, they usually have some what we call certain intent. So they might be looking for shoes, they might be looking for uh, something to, to buy a gift for, for their partners or so on. And this is why we developed this product, uh, this product called Customer Intent. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand the buyer cycle. And the end goal for this is to deliver an engagement, engaging and tailored experience. So we want to tailor uh, or personalize experience for every customer so that we can better understand and respond to their needs. And uh, that's why we use this buyer cycle customer intent model, right? Because we believe that intent, or we know that intent is different in every visit. Sometimes your intent is to just browse around, see what's new. Sometimes you are looking for a specific item. Sometimes you are seeking for help. Sometimes you, know, you want to check what are the new trends or what style of jeans fits my figure, and so on. Uh, we know that intent varies during a season, uh, session, sorry. so you might start looking at baby clothes, but then you might move to shoes, and then after that you might look for a party dress because you just remember you're going out on a Friday. And we know that it can be learned from data, or at least we believe it can be learned from data. And finally, we know that the nature of data, and this is really important because this is how we're going to model the data, uh, is sequential. So let me explain you what customer intent is. We mo again, we model the customer intent using the buyer cycle model, which is a framework for understanding customers and personalizing the experience. Uh, it maps the customer's buying process into these four stages, exploring, gathering, comparing, and making decisions. Uh, the first part is exploring. You can imagine here, someone is in their train to work, they're thinking about the weekend, they're checking the weather, and they're saying, I have a party, I need a cocktail dress, but I have none, I'm going to Zalando and check what's out there, you know? Or may, they may even not have that last part of the cocktail dress. They're just bored and they're just browsing around. Then, usually people move to the gathering phase. They look for options to serve their needs. You know, for example, I'm going to that party next weekend, what dresses does Zalando have? I'm gonna search for Ted Baker, or maybe a skirt will be better, you know? People are still really early on their decision-making pro progress, and they may add some things to their wish list to later assess what's best for them. Um, then the people narrow down the, their choice. Uh, how many of you have been shopping in Zalando or another e-commerce fashion site, and you have a few tabs open, you know? One with a black shoe, one with the, the blue shoe, one with the white shoe, and they're all the same model, but you don't know which one to pick, right? And I'm seeing some smiles here. This is something, everyone does, right? So that's the comparing phase. And finally, people make a decision, hopefully, and they buy something or they add it to wish list, or else they become disengaged because they didn't find the right thing. And our mission here is allowing or helping people find the right things and, and making it personal, right? So what do we use in terms of computer science to make this happen? We use a Markov or hidden Markov models. You can see a Markov, hidden Markov. Um, that's, that's a joke, um, right? Uh, hidden Markov models are probabilistic models known to work really well at exploiting, exploiting temporal patterns, right? They are being used a lot in speech recognition, speech synthesis, uh, handwriting, or gesture recognition in sports and things like that. And we think, or when we started developing this product, we thought it will work really well because of the nature of our data was very similar. And one, something really interesting about this type of uh, model is that the future state uh, is only based on the current state. So it's independent on the, on the history, right? So you can always kind of start from scratch. 
Let me go into more detail to explain uh, the hidden Markham model. So the hidden Markham model, and Sergio will go into more details about the implementation and details about the model itself later, and how we, how we make it scale. But uh, it's defined by a number of states, a set of initial probabilities, a transition matrix, and, uh, and an emission uh, probabilities matrix, right? So we have to learn some of, this, some of these things to make the model work, right? And then we also know that for each state, there's certain type of observations that can happen. And the probability of uh, obtaining each observation is a function of a state, right? Of course, the states are hidden, so we don't know what are the states. In this case, we model four states. So let me go a bit more into detail into what kind of features, what are our observations, and what are the states that we're trying to model. This is what it looks like, right? We have some observations. People come into Zalando and they see this. This is our homepage, right? That's one feature. People click on a homepage. People go into a shop, right? We have different shops, the training shop. So we go into sports bar. Further down, they go into men's sports shoes, right? They're narrowing down their shoes. So this is a, a, a catalog view page. Then they go to a product display page where we show all the information about a product and they can add it to card, add it to wish list, or see some recommendations of things they like. After that, you know, you can see my wish list here. It's mostly shoes because that's like what I wear a lot. Like everything else, I just wear the same every day. Um, and that's something that we use as a feature, you know, when people add something to the wish list or remove something to the wish list. Um, finally, hopefully people make a purchase, right? That's the end goal. And then we add that as a feature as well. So we use all these type of features of customer behavior uh, to try to predict in which state is a customer at every given time. So are they exploring? Are they gathering information? Are they comparing across different categories or products? Or are they trying to make a decision? To make it a bit more clear, let me go through an example. It's a dummy example, but it will help us. You can see here there's an axis uh, and there's a wheel. The axis will show for each color, red exploring, green gathering, blue comparing, and white decision. What is the prediction that we have at any given state? So in this example, I have to buy something for my friend's baby who's just been born. So I'm going to browse through kids' things. And honestly, I have no idea about what to buy because, you know, I don't, I don't buy these things very often. So I start here. So all the predictions look pretty much the same. As long as I start browsing, you know, the exploring, the exploring probability goes up. It's higher. And all the other probabilities are down because I'm still in the exploring phase. I'm looking at this type of clothes. I don't really know that even the terminology. So I browse a lot by tags and by clicking on things, right? So again, I'm exploring more and more. All of a sudden, I go into this type of clothes. And the probabilities for gathering and comparing go up, while the probabilities for exploring go down. As I look into similar type of clothes, the system is very sure that I'm in this gathering mode. And so on, and so on, and I start looking for things. And then I finally start comparing between these two things. Should I go for blue? Should I go for red? Should I go for blue? Should I go for red, right? So the comparing probabilities are going up in this case, uh, right? Then I finally go and I say, let's go for white uh, and gray and black. I'm sure one of them will like them and the baby will wear them anyway. Um, I often, when I give this talk, I say, babies have no opinion on what they're wearing. And people have made me very clear to know that parents do have opinions. And yeah, sometimes they don't like what you give them. Uh, I hope this is not the case. But I made a purchase and the probability for decision increases now, right? So this is more or less how it works. But okay, this is only the conceptual part. We need to understand how we're actually going to build this into our customers, build this into production, right? So let me explain you what is our architecture. And in Zalando, we believe the architecture should also follow the team structure. It's really, really important. So I want to talk about what we call autonomous teams, or they are often called product teams in other organizations. These are teams that are working most of the times around only one product. You know, and in our case, we have research engineers or data scientists. That's how we call data scientists in Zalando. We have engineers 
uh, we have a product person and we have someone who is managing or orchestrating, right? And the whole team does everything, feature extraction, data exploration, uh, the machine learning models, the, the code, the deployment, the, the monitoring, and we also do 24 seven, which means that if something breaks at 3 a.m. in the morning, we have to go, we get a call and we have to fix it, right? Which means we write things so that they don't break because we don't want to be awake, uh, be, get a call at 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so far it hasn't happened yet, right? <laughs> Uh, and I want to talk a bit about, about the main components that we have for this type of architecture. Uh, the first, com uh, we build everything on AWS, so all of our products, all of our services are in the cloud, and for this product we use Python, and specifically we use PySpark. Uh, and we run everything on Stops. A Stop is an open source project in Zalando, and is a conven convenient, audit compliant, platform as a service, right? So it means we have an infrastructure team that build this whole infrastructure uh, platform for us. So it's easier for, for us to manage, you know? And we have things like MIA, that is a command line utility. We have Sensa that helps us deploy. We have Keo, which is our application registry. Uh, and we have also Peer One, that is our Docker registry. Fun fact, you might not be aware, but all the names for our tech stack is named after brands which sometimes makes it really weird because you might be wearing a, a t-shirt while working on that component at the same time, you know, same brand. Uh, it's a bit weird, but anyway. Uh, then, right, I explain a bit like in general terms what the architecture looks like. And I want to explain a bit more about what we call the uh, data snorkeling architecture. And this is based from our talk in PyCon last year when we were actually thinking a lot about this architecture. We need to build a flexible framework to review and share data science knowledge across teams. So not only within team, but across teams. And we've made a lot of effort and we've written a lot and given a lot of thought about this. And you can check out this uh, blog post because the slides will be available later. So it looks like this. We use, of course, AWS and stops. Uh, we store a lot of our data on S3. We use Python, we use Spark, we use Matplotlib, Scikit-learn. Uh, we also use Scala, right, sometimes. And uh, we execute a lot of these things in Zeppelin notebooks because they, they, they go really well with the architecture that we have. And you can uh, execute them in the cloud, they scale, works really, really well. And this is an example of how a uh, Zeppelin notebook looks like. And they're really good for prototyping. They're integrated with the, all the things that we use. They're multi-language, so it means you can write a line of Python, then you can write some SQL code, then you can write some Scala code. It's really good. Um, and they're stored on S3. So the, the bad thing, though, is that they don't render on GitHub, so we've been having a lot of issues when uh, reviewing this, uh, this type of work, right? So we usually do kind of rubber duck review where we sit together and we go through the thing and we say, okay, this is wrong, you need to fix it. Um, and now is our production uh, production architecture, which uh, Sergio will talk about. So I talk about the fun things and then he talks about the serious things. And this is how we usually divide the work. <laughs> Thanks, Alberto. Hi, everyone. My name is Sergio. First of all, I have uh, to thank you for being here tonight. I know that this is the very last talk of the conference and we are all a little bit tired, so I'll try to be, uh, to be as quick as possible. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about three different things here. I'm going to talk about uh, the tools that we use for our use case, <coughs> the architecture that we have in place, and finally I will explain a little bit about how we have uh, scaled out the implementation that we have done about HMM so that we can actually train models using millions of uh, sequences from our customers. We use EMR for our data processing. As you know, EMR is basically a managed Hadoop cluster on top of uh, EC2 instances. This is really flexible because it let us choose the number of instances that we are using in our cluster and the sizes of the instances that we want to use. So if we have a job that is very intensive in terms of memory, we can use machines that, are very, uh, that have a very high memory. Or if we have a job that is very intensive in terms of CPU, we can use machines with more CPUs. So that we can actually really tailor the data that we have to process together with the cluster that we are using. So that's very cost effective for the team. 
EMR are actually very well integrated with other EMR, uh, AWS tools as well, such as uh, S3 or the data pipelines. Uh, so it's really easy if you are using EMR to read the data from S3, do whatever processing you have to do, and then put the results back into S3. And actually, if you are protecting your buckets with some credentials or some roles, it's very easy to assign those roles into the EMR cluster so that it, it actually handles all the, that access to your buckets. It's also very well integrated with the data pipelines, so it's very easy for you to create an EMR cluster from a data pipeline. Let's say that you want to schedule your job, and I will go over this in a few seconds. Uh, you can create that EMR cluster with a few lines of code in your data pipeline, and it will be spinning up your cluster for you in just a few uh, <coughs> lines of code. You can also define the set of uh, bootstrap actions that you want to run in your cluster, and everything will be managed for you. And they actually are integrated as well with external applications such as uh, Spark or Flink or Zeppelin Notebooks, as Umberto was saying before. So that if you want to use one of these applications on top of your cluster, that's really easy. You just have to choose the application from the UI or the command line. You just type the name and it will be uh, spinning up and installing the application up on top of your cluster. So that if you want to do a very uh, quick test using a Spark with a cluster, you can just uh, say to, uh, to AWS to install a Spark on your cluster for you. We're also using data pipelines. Uh, data pipelines uh, let you define very complex, uh, it's a web service that lets you define uh, complex <laughs> workloads. And it lets you define and schedule and schedule your workloads uh, for you. They are very resilient, uh, they are repeatable, and they are uh, highly available for you. And it lets you define interdependencies between tasks. So let's say that you want to run a few steps. You can define a data pipeline with those steps, and you can actually uh, you can say that your second task actually depends on this first one. So you can create those dependencies pretty easy with just uh, a couple of lines of code. Uh, it's really easy to create resources actually with data pipelines. You can see, you can say that your data pipeline can run on top of a EC2 instance or a AWS EMR cluster. So you just have to specify those type of resources on, the, on your data pipeline. I it will take care of them for you. You can actually, it will, it's very nice because uh, let's say that you are waiting for some data to be available for you. So the data pipeline won't spin up your cluster till that data is available. So you won't, wa won't waste any type of resources. And you can actually also define pre, pre and post conditions to your steps. So let's say that you want to create a few flags uh, after your, your steps has run. So you can just do that with uh, just a line of code. Sorry. Just so this is more or less the architecture that we are using for our use case. Uh, the data uh, comes to us uh, from a different team that gets uh, the tracking data from our customers. And it's the store in that S3 bucket that you can see in there. And then we have a job in Spark, by Spark actually, that is computing our features from our customers and storing those features in a bucket. Those features are actually the observation from our customers that Umberto just mentioned before. For example, the number of uh, product views that the customer has done, or the number of purchases, or the number of products that the customer has put into their wish list, or if they have browsed a certain brand, or anything that you think that is relevant from our customers. That's actually the features that we are extracting and inputting into that bucket. So using those features together with a model that has been previously trained by one of our data scientists using the data snorkeling that Umberto mentioned before, we have a second by Spark job that actually scores the journey of our customers and stores the results into a different S3 bucket. We are actually saving two types of results. We are saving raw results, that is basically a score per each one of the customer actions. And we are saving aggregated scores, that is basically an overview of the customer during the last end sessions. Well, I, I have to mention this is, as you can see, this is a batch architecture. We are not doing real-time processing here. So this is the architecture that we have used till now, but our idea is to move this into real-time in the future. So instead of reading the data from an S3 bucket, what we want to do is we want to be able to consume these events coming from, for example, a Kafka cluster. So that we will have a thing, for example, job that will be consuming those events on real time and ingesting the data, for example, in a Cassandra database. And then using an API on top of that Cassandra database, we will be able actually to serve those values to our consumers in real time. 
so that, as Humberto was saying, uh, we can actually personalize the experience of our customers in real time. If we know that the customer is actually interested in only a certain type of products, we will only give them those products. Uh, or if the customer is trying to look for some experience in real time, we will actually serve them with, with the newest trends, some fashion, or with some editorial and content that we think that is going to be relevant for them. As I was mentioning before, there are two different types on our architecture, uh, two different types of jobs. Actually, in our architecture, we have a job that is actually creating our features from our customers. And there is a second job that is actually computing the scores for our customers. The reason why we are choosing two different pipelines for generating this data is basically because the requirements that we have for these jobs are different. We are using different types of clusters for each one of these processes. And we thought that it was easier for us to go to have two different pipelines to compute these jobs. Different options could be just to have one single pipeline with two different actually uh, EMR resources and we can compute each one on each one of those clusters and the data pipeline will take care of that for us as well. As Humberto was mentioning before, uh, we have in Zalando we are autonomous teams. What it means is that we work together with the product uh, organization in order to define the business requirements that we have for our use cases. But then we are actually responsible of all the life cycle of our products. We have to make the technical design, uh, the implementation, the testing, monitoring, and 24-7. Uh, for, con for continuous integration and continuous delivery, we use actually Jenkins. There is a team that is providing Jenkins as a service within Zalando, so it's really easy for us to integrate Jenkins together with all our infrastructure. We use Jenkins for testing our uh, pull requests, so we cannot merge our pull requests if the test hasn't passed in Jenkins before, or for example, if we don't have enough test coverage on our branches. We also use Jenkins for the deployment of our master branch, and actually we have an open source project in Zalando that is called Lisi that you have in there. Uh, that is very handy because it let us deploy um, cloud formation stacks from Jenkins. So if we are working actually on, a, on an API, we can actually deploy that, uh, apply, sorry, deploy that stack into, uh, uh, into cloud formation using Lisi from Jenkins. It's all automated, so you don't have to worry about anything. We are also using Jenkins for the automatic deployment of experimentation branches. And we are actually publishing those artifacts into S3. What I mean by that is that uh, at some stage when we are doing a lot of data science jobs and we are doing some kind of uh, feature exploration or model exploration, we have to, do, to write a lot of code and then we have to do uh, testing with live data or with real data from our customers that is stored in S3. So what we do with this is we deploy the artifacts that has been built on top, on top of the exploration, experimentation branches on S3. So that is very easy for the data scientists to go into AWS, create a cluster, and install the code that comes from that as artifact, and actually test the new features into uh, real data. For monitoring, we use uh, Sedmon. Sedmon is actually an internal tool. It's also open source, and it was created by Zalando. And it lets you define checks on top of entities. An entity is, for example, an EC2 instance that you want to check uh, its memory or its disk usage. So you can just define those checks. Then you can define alerts on top of those checks. For example, if you want to get alerted when your memory usage goes up to 90%, so you can define those checks using that one. And it's also integrated with Grafana, so that is really easy to plot the evolution of your system over time, and you can uh, get a nice overview on how your system is behaving. I'm going to go on now, and I'm going to explain a little bit about how we scale out uh, our implementation of HMM. So our first approach was actually using uh, a library in Python that is called HMM Learn. HMM Learn was actually it's written in Python and it was actually part of the scikit-learn library that you probably guys know. Uh, and then it was moved to its own repo. And we were actually, when we started using this library, we were restricted, restricted by two factors. The CPU that basically limits the time that we need for training and the memory that basically limits the data that we can use for training up to whatever we can fit into one single machine. HMM is basically a standalone library. What it means is that it's not distributed. You can use it in your own machine, but it's not going to be distributed across um, a cluster. 
So we have this thing in Thailand that is called Hack Week. A Hack Week is basically a week, a week in which uh, we get together with people from different departments and different teams and we work together on different ideas or cool projects. The projects don't really have to be work related. For example, some of the guys in our office last year, they work on a sensor that they install in our pool table so that they don't have to go to the basement every time that they want to check if someone is playing pool. They just want to go to the server and check if someone is playing uh, pool. So what we did was actually we decided to work on a distributed implementation of HMM Learn using PySpark. And that's actually the project that we did for our help week. When working with HMM, basically you have to consider two different types of algorithms. You have to use uh, BitRB. Uh, BitRB is used when you have a customer sequence, like the ones that you have here on the right hand, uh, left hand side, well, my left, your right hand side of the screen. Uh, you have those customer sequence and you want to predict what is the customer state, uh, you will use the BitRB algorithm. Uh, so our customer sequences usually uh, are in the order of a few thousands maximum. So it's not really a problem to distribute this algorithm. You, we can basically, if this is your data frame, you can basically do a map function and a lambda function on, to your, on top of those sequences. And you can predict individually each one of those sequences on, on a different machine. So it's not a, not, not a big deal. Uh, you, say, you also have to use the expectation maximum extension algorithm for training. Uh, as Humberto was saying, uh, HMM model is defined by three different types of matrices. So in order to learn those matrices, you have to use the EM algorithm. This is why we decided actually to focus our efforts on parallelizing this algorithm. The EM algorithm is an interactive algorithm. It means that each iteration of the algorithm is going to improve the scores and the parameters that you have in your model and each iteration depends on the results on the previous iteration you can you cannot actually parallel you cannot parallelize the overall process you have to parallelize each one of the individual iterations so what we are going to try to do with this algorithm is we are going to come up with very nice values for the initial state probability that is going to define uh, the initial state the initial probability of each one of our states so for example whether at the beginning of a sequence our customers are going to be exploring uh, gathering comparing or deciding uh, it's going to come up with values for the transition matrix that is going to define how the customer actually move from one state to the other and it's going to come up with values for the emission probabilities that is basically uh, the probability of, of getting each one of the types of observations for each one of the states. For example, if I'm, um, let's say, exploring, what's the probability that my next action will be, for example, uh, doing a sale, a purchase. So each one of those iterations that I was talking about is actually made up, uh, made up of four different steps. Uh, first, we have to broadcast the values to all our workers, and then we'll do the expectation step. Then we will do the maximization step, and then we will monitor the conver convergence of our parameters. If our algorithm has already converged, we will stop. If it hasn't, we will go back to the first step and keep going. So. Actually, the magic of this uh, parallel version of EM uh, happens here. So basically, in here, you have on the uh, right-hand side, you have how for each one of the rows in our data frame, that is basically each of our customer sequences, we do a map function. And for each one of those uh, sequences, we do the following steps. We compute the logarithmic likelihood, we calculate the forward and backwards lattice, we compute the posteriors, and we compute the changes on the parameters. These, these steps are actually pretty similar to the ones that are implemented in the uh, standalone version of HMM Learn. So what we've done is that we have had this distributed version of the algorithm. We actually map that into our data frame. And once that we have computed that across all our different machines, we aggregated those values. That is the second box that you can see in here. Those aggregations are actually when we compute the total sum of the values that each one of our workers has computed in the distributed version of our algorithm. Here you have um, just uh, an experiment that we perform in order to see how our distributed implementation was performing. Uh, so we use the same training set for the two versions of the algorithm, for the standalone version and for the distributed version. Uh, the standalone version is the one in here in blue, and the one in orange is the one that is distributed. Uh, we did this experiment in AWS, and we were using those type of machines, M4 2x large. 
And on the standalone version, of course, we use only one machine versus the 15 machines that we use for the distributed version. Um, so the first mo one of the models that we trained, for example, uh, we were using uh, 500,000 sessions of real customer data. Uh, using the standalone version, it took us 92 minutes in order to train a model using those uh, 500,000 sessions. Uh, a model trained with a distributed version using exactly the same train data took only 6.5 minutes. If you do the maths, this is basically like 15 times lower than the standalone version. What it means is that basically our algorithm is case linearly with a number of machines of our cluster, so that's pretty good. Uh, also, we compare the uh, uh, values that we obtain of the different matrices of our, our the two versions of the algorithm to make sure that we were actually getting the same results. And we did, actually. And we also train a model with using 10 million of uh, sessions from our customers and it, uh, with a distributed version. It, it took us something like uh, 100 minutes, so what is pretty good compared to the 92 minutes that took us to train uh, 500,000 sessions with a, a standalone version of the model. So this uh, distributed implementation of the algorithm led us to faster training. So we can, tra we can experiment faster with our model. We can come up with new features. We can do uh, we can train models faster with different um, configuration of the parameters, so it let us actually create better models. And we can also train our models with larger data sets. What it means is that we are going to learn be better the customer behavior and we are going to be able to serve our customers better than before. Just a little bit of uh, summary regarding the learnings during this project. The STAPS uh, landscape is designed for production environments. It actually takes a lot of uh, the hard lifting for us. For example, if you, as Lando is a, uh, it's a public invested company, so we have to keep uh, monitoring of all the applications that we developed uh, and we deploy to our production environment. So the STAPS environment actually does that for us. For that, so it's very nice if you have to do some uh, auditory systems. It's really nice uh, for the data scientists to use uh, Zeppelin notebooks in order to iterate faster. So if you are doing some experimentations, it's a really nice tool. If you want to do some quick and dirty things, I would really recommend to use uh, Zeppelin notebooks on top of your EMR clusters. And actually it's already integrated with EMR, so it's really easy to use them. Finding bottlenecks before optimizing resources, what I mean here is that uh, for example, before uh, going into, optima uh, into parallelizing HMM, we actually hit that no bottleneck. So we actually put the resources into what was making a difference for us. We didn't go straight away into trying to optimize the algorithm, but we actually hit that bottleneck, bottleneck <coughs> first. And it actually helped us optimizing the resources of the team where we put our work. Uh, the optimization of the deployment of the experimentation branches using Jenkins actually reduced a lot of the overhead that we were having. So when I was working on, a, on, new, on new features for the model, it was very handy for me that Jenkins was actually building those artifacts for me and deploying, deploying them into S3. And then I just got to go to AWS and create a new EMR cluster with the new version of the code that was deployed by Jenkins. So it was very handy for me. It really uh, reduced the time that it took me to explore new things. Pipelines are resilient if you configure them correctly. So if you've never used uh, AWS pipeline, it takes a while to get used to them and there is a little bit of a learning curve involved into that. But once that you get used to them, they are very handy for, for example, scheduling, scheduling daily jobs. And alerting has uh, really helped us for, to move from experimentation to production. Uh, at the beginning, we were a very experimenting uh, team, and we, this is probably the first uh, use case that we moved into production. So this alerting with Simon has really helped us to move uh, and to make that a step forward. And finally, this is the team uh, that was actually working on this use case at that time. Uh, in Zalando, our teams changed quite a lot uh, pretty quickly, so we focus on different things and we move a lot around. So as you can see, more or less, uh, our teams are made up of uh, engineers and data scientists. Uh, we have, I think, two engineers here and three data scientists, but we move quite a lot. So cool, I think that that's everything from our side. If you have any questions, I'll be, we will be very happy to answer them. Cheers. <laughs>